Thank you. I'm Dr. Stephen Swallen. Uh, I teach Chemistry 155. It's the second semester of the uh, Chemistry for Science majors or people interested in health uh, itch, uh, fields or science. Um, and I've had the great uh, benefit of working with a fantastic group of students who are part of that class. These are the some of the best and brightest in the course. Um, we have met on a weekly basis throughout the semester to uh, work in a sort of a seminar format, as, as scientists often do. We came up with uh, a general question that we wanted to investigate through the semester. Uh, and then each of the students went into the literature and found sources that investigated uh, some part of this question. Our broad uh, question that we were going to look at was resources, how we use resources in the world, uh, how we get them, how we use them, dispose of them, and the impacts that they have uh, on the world. And uh, so we worked together as a group uh, each week. Somebody would uh, find some something in the literature, come lead a discussion for us, uh, and then collectively at the end, uh, we put the ideas together for uh, these global resource uh, investigation. So if you guys can come up, we have uh, Danielle Baker, well, as you guys come up, I can introduce each of them. Uh, okay, so, well, sure. Danielle Baker, uh, well, we've got Christian Naxi, Kimberly, uh, Kimberly Sickert, uh, Allison Bowman, Lara Reem, uh, Molly Bame. Let's see, did I get everybody? Okay, good. Okay, uh, and so they will tell us about the research that we investigated this semester. All right, so we talked about managing our global resources. Um, so planet Earth is made up of many diverse systems that come together to form a resilient yet delicate environment humans call home. And within this, in, this environment are many um, sources of energy that, or other, for another name for it would be resources, um, and uh, that we have found to be efficient source, resources of, sources of energy. So um, while removing a few of these uh, resources does not have a detriment, detriment on our environment, uh, mass extraction, distribution, and disposal may cause harm to the environment and the environment's inhabitants. So the task that individuals need to take upon themselves is to be well educated about such matters and then apply this knowledge to take action and amend the way these um, resources are consumed. So. Um, Today's presentation will uh, explore a few of these many topics that concern how the use of how the use of resources impacts the environment, as well as possible solutions that could be and have been applied. Um, the discussion will include subjects concerning um, energy, water, and then land, animals, and air. Um, and the goal of this the goal is that this information will wear, raise awareness of what is taking place every day all over the world and possible future in the possible future that these occurrences could lead to. So the first subject will introduce the topic of land and organisms by examining the impact of obtaining and distributing uh, rare earth metals. So if none of you, if some of you are unfamiliar what rare earth metals are, they are oral deposits that are lithonides and exhibit similar chemical properties. So they, most of them come from um, the same type of family on the periodic table. Um, there's a few that um, are not, but as you can tell on the picture on the, on your right, um, they all look very similar, which makes it very difficult to extract them because you can't tell the differences when you first look at them. So it, you have to use different chemicals, which can be very harmful. And that is why um, in 1984, the Molly Corpse Minerals Company, which was based out of California, um, supplied 100% of the U.S. demand 
and 30% of the world's demand. But that was shut down in 2002 because we found out how harmful these chemicals are. And now China currently produces 95% of the world's supply um, of the rare earth elements, which is shocking. We talk about how the Middle East controls um, oil, but we don't talk about how China controls the rare earth elements. And some of these uses are the Department of Defense. Um, they're used in target weapon systems and communications, as well as the Department of Energy uses them for, um, they're important in our clean energy, which we will learn more about later on in the presentation. Um, the lens polish, which is used in our cell phones, our computers, um, cameras, batteries, x-ray films, color TVs, and temperature sensors, all things that we don't want to live without anymore. So we have to be able to recycle and come up with ways that we're going to be able to manage what we want and how we use these. Okay, so mining has detrimental effects to uh, land, water, and wildlife. And the most obvious effect is that it kills the existing vegetation there. Um, focusing primarily on strip mining, strip mining is a process of removing overlaying soil and rock. And so this destroys the important soil layers. And those consist of millions of microorganisms per teaspoon. Some strip mining machines can move up to 12,000 cubic meters of this fertile earth per hour. Runoff from mines pollute water, and whether this be affecting the pH level, which causes it to be the water hardness, or if it pollutes and corrodes metal because it becomes acidic, or it could cause runoff of heavy metals, which are heavy elements, and if consumed, they bind to cellular components inside your body. And even though we aren't drinking this water directly, usually, we do eat fish that have high concentrations of these heavy metals. So indirectly, we're consuming the heavy metals, and the toxicity is coming into our bodies. And then wildlife. As you can see from the picture, it's obviously it's obvious that the species of animals are displaced and potentially their breeding grounds. Also, as a direct correlation with the water pollution, the water can be toxic and if they drink it, it can hurt their reproduction rates. And all of these together could eliminate a species. So everything we do um, impacts the environment. And sadly, that means hundreds of species go extinct every day. This is largely due to habitat loss, such as deforestation, and chemical intervention, such as pesticides. Two major species in Wisconsin alone have faced this problem, that being the bald eagle and the honeybees. So for the bald eagle, um, a poorly studied pesticide called DDT was introduced in 1939. And shortly after we started using it, we started seeing a very sharp decrease in the population of bald eagles. And this is due to the fact that the pesticide caused eggshell thinning, which obviously decreased the population. Once that we saw this correlation, we banned DDT, and we saw a sharp increase in the population again. And later, in later studies, we realized DDT also caused cancer in humans, which is obviously kind of scary to think that we were using this in our foods, and we didn't even know it was a carcinogen. OK, so another one was the honeybee. And for a few years back, all these honeybees started dying, and we couldn't figure out why. And it was obviously really scary, because we need honeybees for everything. So, um, and we realized it's pesticides causing this. So we found out that fipronil is seen as the main cause, or the main pesticide. And a really good, well, not a good example, but example of this is in Minnesota, because shortly after they sprayed the fields with this, um, piles of honeybees were found dead everywhere. And so obviously an effort is being made to ban this pesticide. OK. So um, as you can see, history repeats itself. Um, the same thing that happened to the bald eagles is happening to the bees. But this, for the bees, we don't know how this is going to turn out. I mean, it turned out good for the bald eagles, but hopefully we're hoping for the same effect for the honeybees. 
This issue can easily be solved by studying these pesticides before we use them. And then how does this affect us? As you can see, this is a supermarket without honeybees. We need them to pollinate our fruit and everything we eat. And also, if you think about it, if this chemical is just killing piles of honeybees, what do you think it's going to do to us? Okay, thank you. So the best way to prevent any damage to land and areas where animals are is to just either stop mining in areas so we don't have to worry about what's going to happen later, or put some laws into order that make it so that mining companies have to restore land after they've used it. This law has only been put in place in Alaska where there's huge amounts of coal mining and gold mining. Before Alaskan mines were able to just dump their tailings, the big pieces of bedrock that they broke up to get the minerals that they need, right on top of the topsoil, nothing could grow back for many years because nothing could break through the rock. But with this law in place, they have to replace the rock back down, put the topsoil on top, and start doing whatever they can to speed up the ecological rebound in the area, which in places like Alaska is super fast. This also prevents any adverse effects on human health in the coal mining areas because then you have plants and animals that can just soak up or use up any of these resources that we normally couldn't. Now the land that you restore at the mining sites can be used for a number of different things. It doesn't have to be limited to agriculture because there is a problem with some mining and agriculture. If you put farms in an area where there was heavy metal mining, that runoff that was talked about earlier that holds these heavy metal ions in it can cause serious health issues. Like cadmium, it's so similar to calcium in its structure that when it enters the human body, it can cause serious health problems. It can enter your neurons and screw up any action potentials that you need to do any sort of movement. So the best thing to do with this land is just to figure out what the community needs. You can use it for real estate development, businesses. It doesn't have to be limited to farming. Now, unfortunately, not a lot of research has been done into frac sand mining areas and what we can do to that land after it's been used. That's because a lot of these places are still open, they're still using the land, and a lot of them are land renting now. So when they're done with the land, they can just hand it back to the previous owners, and it's not their problem anymore. Because of this, a lot of places in Wisconsin have decided that they're either trying to ban frac sand mining in the area completely, which is awesome, but it does bring a lot of economical growth in the area and is fairly good for the area in that way. So they're trying to pass laws about reclamation instead, but it's a really expensive process. It takes about $1.5 million to restore the average mining area. And we don't know who's going to pay for this. Is it going to be taxpayers? Is it going to be the companies? Because surely the companies don't want to pay for it. And we don't know who's going to decide what happens to this mining land later. Are taxpayers once again going to decide? We want a mall here or we want a farm here? Or if the companies are in charge of everything, what are they going to want to put in? So overall, more funding needs to be put into the research in this area because we don't know what's going to happen to a lot of these mining sites after they're closed. And reclamation is becoming an extremely important process considering the huge amount of growth we've had in the population. We're going to need that extra space. And that extra space can be used for a lot of different things and we're going to need other resources too. So what if in the future we didn't have any more land to um, reclamate and um, just because that might be a problem in the future as you can see as the uh, population grows is estimated in 50 years that will increase by 150 percent and how will we use our future building materials? Uh, concrete production is definitely a growing issue 
because with the increased population, there will be an increase in urbanization. And with that in mind, there will be larger cities, more buildings, and yes, more concrete production in the U.S. And just to give you an idea of how much material we use per year in concrete production, um, it takes about 110,000 times the amount of water in the San Francisco Bay for one year. Um, as you can see, the concrete, um, concrete production is the largest user of natural resources. Here is a list um, that summarizes the amount of resources that we need. And it takes one billion tons of water, which is a lot of water. Um, a total of 11.5 billion tons of concrete is produced as of now. And that will only increase to an approximate 18 billion by 2050. Another issue with concrete is that it is extremely energy intensive. And with that said, there is a lot of carbon dioxide created and an approximate 1.5 billion tons per year. And to the, on the picture on the right is a concrete pillar in Philadelphia that just shows that infrastructure in America does need to be replaced eventually at one point or another, and that only means more concrete production. So what's ha what has been done about this issue? Um, well, we manufacturers have incorporated fly ash. Uh, fly ash is um, ash that comes off of coal after or while it's being burned, and instead of letting it um, pollute our atmosphere, they collect it and burn it to um, for better efficiency. Uh, they also recycle concrete, such as putting it back in the roads as aggregate. Um, they've also added fibers to the concrete to make it stronger. And with stronger concrete, uh, you need to replace it less, which means less concrete is being produced. And they've also created a, an amazing process that is CO2-free, as you can see on the picture of the right. And everyone should be aware that concrete production will not s stop anytime soon, but scientists are aware of it and they are doing s things to stop it or to make it better for the environment. So <clears throat> as was said for about the concrete, um, there are many um, components that go into the atmosphere and um, like CO2 from the concrete and um, another component is something we call aerosols. Um, aerosols are um, bits of particulate matter that get thrown up into the atmosphere either by strong winds or um, if there's gas production it'll react with um, with the water vapor in clouds to form different particulate matters. Um, and which either uh, warm or cool the earth, um, depending on whether they reflect the sunlight or whether they absorb it. Uh, so two main types of aerosols are known as sulfuric acid and black carbon. Um, sulfuric acid comes from uh, s sources such as volcanic eruptions and burning of coal, and um, this serves to cool the earth because um, this is a type of aerosol that reflects sunlight. Um, and then black carbon, comes from things such as forest fires, diesel, uh, diesel vehicle exhaust, the burning of coal, and this type of aerosol um, absorbs sunlight, therefore warming the earth. Um, and yeah, so let's go. Um, so as was previously said, uh, aerosols prevent um, the sunlight getting to the earth. So um, it prevents plants from growing. So reduce food. Um, we don't. Uh, you know, humans need uh, sunlight for th their skin, and um, and in, in addition, black carbon can cause respiratory health issues because the particulate matter is so small it can lodge into your lungs and can harden your lungs, um, so you can't breathe properly. And then, so um, there have been efforts to remove sources that produce black carbon. However, uh, the same sources that black carbon comes from are also sources that uh, sulfuric acid come from. So uh, 
by removing the sources of the black carbon. You are therefore removing the sources of sulfuric acid and there's just kind of a circle and it ends up warming the earth instead of cooling the earth. So um, despite the fact that we've got, we're not sure how to solve this problem yet, we have seen um, improved air quality despite population growth. As you can see um, from the picture of Los Angeles there, um, in 1968 it was very hazy, um, lots of air pollutants, and then 2005 it's become much clearer. Um, you can see all the buildings. And then in the graph to the, to the right there, um, you can see a decline in the air of uh, sulfuric dioxide in Canada, which is um, what produces sulf sulfuric acid in the, in the atmosphere. So um, despite population growth, we're seeing um, good changes in the atmosphere quality and um, we'll continue to see it. It's not well studied, but it's still under underway. In relation to air quality is the idea of solar energy. Solar energy is becoming more and more competitive with electrical companies. There's a variety of panels and a major price decline. Since 1977, approximately 100%, there's been a 100% price decline. Since 2007 alone, there's been a 50% decline. The use of solar power contains the potential to save thousands of dollars, not just on electricity bills. These installations also have the power to increase the value of property. Solar power <clears throat> could very easily meet the energy needs of today and the future. City rooftops and desert land are just sitting there absorbing sun and heating the globe. We should be placing solar panels on top of the roofs and in desert land in order to absorb the energy and provide energy for the world. Um, sorry, go back one, please. Thank you. Uh, precious water is being evaporated into the tunnels of irrigation systems. The use of solar panels could prevent evaporation by placing the panels over the tunnels of the systems. The picture on the bottom right is an example of this in India. Solar energy would also cut down on pollution and other atmospheric problems because it is clean energy, as previously stated. Fuels like oil will become more and more limited and eventually go away. This will further drive up the cost of fossil fuels and other things like oil whereas the price of solar, f solar power will fall. Solar energy co currently costs less than grid power in 10 states. This power would better the economy as well as the environmental and security issues. Solar power is abundantly available and sustainable. As you can see on the right-hand picture bottom, um, all of the coal, oil, and gas known to human has the same amount of energy as the sun shines on us in 20 days. As you can see, it is logical to harness the sun's energy. We would get so much out of it. It's time to start saving the earth before destruction is irreversible. Um, solar power will be the next source of energy, and it is always competing. Currently, utility companies are raising their taxes in order to make up for the loss that solar companies have taken from them. We can save the earth now and save money, so why don't we start? Okay, so we've introduced a lot of problems, one of them being the scarcity and our dis dependence on rare earth metals such as lithium. As previously mentioned, 95% of our rare earth metals come from China, and after we're done using them, we recycle them by sending them to third world countries for other people to take apart. So the way we can solve this problem is recycling the ones we have at home. Um, less, that creates less finding and more American jobs because we need less from China. 
And mining ruins the necessary fertile soil layers, pollutes water, and lowers wildlife populations. So more effective land restoration, less mining, recycling, and smarter mining. A uh, big problem with cement production was that it causes environmental destruction as well as air pollution, and it hurt worker he workers' health, such along with the black carbon with aerosols as well. So I included a picture of healthy lung tissue compared to a miner who had been mining for 30 years and his lung tissue. So a solution would be quality air filters, using old cement as a filler, which creates less need for new cement, and finding uses for the old cement. So we've been using pesticides to grow more efficient food for our ever-growing population, and due to this, animals, birds, and different bees have been dying. Okay, and a way we could solve this again is by banning these pesticides that we know cause problems, studying pesticides better, and just, you know, testing these before we actually use them. A problem with aerosols directly was that some particles absorb light and others affect light, reflect light, and this affects the climate accordingly, whether it warms it or cools it. So burning restrictions and controlled aerosol bans? Um, well, the initial cost of solar is higher than the average family can afford. It saves money in the long run. And because of solar energy, electrical companies are losing money, so they're charging more initially to compensate for their losses. Like we just stated, buy solar is a more upfront cost, but it saves so much more money in the end. So the first step we have to do to fix some of these problems is to become aware of our consequences of things such as mining or making concrete and all the other stuff. Recycling, it is so easy to do and it saves so much. And we need to put an effort into our solutions. So maybe switch to solar. So we've presented many issues and I don't think there's any clear right answer to fix all of them, but the little solutions can add up in the long run and it's important to acknowledge this. Thank you.